Bless you, Lord. And truly, Lord, <laughs> we are lost without you. Lord, we're nothing apart from you. And yet, Lord, in, through, and because of you, Lord, we got it all. So, Lord, what else can we do? How else could we possibly respond but to come and gather as the Ohana, the family, just to worship you, to praise you, and now, Lord, to learn of you. And Lord, we do pray that by your spirit, you would teach us, Lord, touch us, transform us, we pray, from glory to glory. In Jesus' name we ask, and all God's people say, amen, amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, as we continue our study through the New Testament, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, which I believe is a very important thing. I think it's important that we systematically study through the totality of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, so we get the whole counsel of God. Look, there's nothing worse than getting a part of the information. We need the whole counsel of God from beginning to end. Uh, I, I think it's problematic jumping around from this book to that book to this book to that book because the danger is that there are those who feel that maybe one part of the Bible, one book of the Bible might not be as exciting or interesting as some other part or book of the Bible. In fact, I know pastors who've never taught through the book of Leviticus nor Second Chronicles, and I think those are two very exciting books. Okay, you can pray for me. But look, it's all the Word of God, and it is all very powerful and very practical. And I hope we, like Paul in ministering to the Ephesian elders there in Miletus in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, can say, I never shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So I think one reason it's important is so we get the whole counsel of God. But I think a second reason why it's important is that we don't simply teach on topics taking this topic or that topic. Now, don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with pulling out a topic as we go through the Scripture and looking more in depth at it. And we're going to be doing that, of course, as we go through the book of Acts and dealing with the Holy Spirit. In one part, it only talks about one aspect of the Holy Spirit, so it would be good to stop and really expand and talk about the, the full ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. So there's nothing wrong with taking a, a topic out of Scripture as you're going through Scripture. But to take this topic or that topic and deal with only this topic and only that topic, it can become very dangerous because the pastor in his sick and twisted little mind thinks that somehow he knows what's best for us and somehow he's going to straighten us out where he might be thinking well you know the church is pretty carnal I think we'll go through first Corinthians yeah that'll straighten them out or he sits back and thinks well you know they're a lazy bunch I know let's go through the book of James I'll fix their little wagon you follow me or if he wants money, he'll say, now we're going to do a 12-week series on tithing and giving and what a blessing it is to give. Are you kidding me? It can be very dangerous and very detrimental in simply looking at one topic or another topic or another. No, I think it's good we go through the totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Well, before we actually get into our text today, here in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we're going to be looking at a few things by way of background and or introduction to the book. Uh, there are seven of them in all. Number one, the first thing is the who. Who wrote the book? Well, many scholars believe that it was Luke who wrote the book of Acts. Uh, early church fathers like Arrhenius, Clement, Tertullian, and Eusebius and others all affirm that Luke is the author of the book of Acts. Now Luke, of course, also wrote the Gospel of Luke, uh, where the Gospel of Luke leaves off the book of Acts 
picks up. Uh, these two uh, go hand in hand. Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is really a two volume set, if you will, to be read congruently. Now, Luke, interestingly enough, is a very prolific writer. While it is true, Paul the Apostle wrote about a third of the New Testament as it pertains to the number of books. He wrote a great many number of books, barring the Gospels. Luke, on the other hand, wrote more words in the New Testament than Paul did. So Luke actually wrote quite a bit more of the New Testament than any other of the gospel or any other of the writers of the New Testament. Now there are a few things we know about the author of the book, Luke, uh, in Colossians chapter four, verses seven through 11. Uh, most believe he was a Gentile, not a Jew, because he's not mentioned as one of the circumcision or one of the Jews, which would make him the only writer of the New Testament to be Greek, not Jewish. Kind of interesting. Uh, according to Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible tells us that Luke is Paul's beloved physician. So Luke is a doctor, he's a physician. And as we go through the book of Acts, we're gonna see him talking about the various illnesses with a little bit of detail and also making some diagnoses regarding the various illnesses that we'll see going through the book of Acts. Uh, according to Acts chapter 16, verses nine and 10, Luke was also a traveling companion with Paul on his second and third missionary journeys. He also accompanied him to Rome. Now, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Luke was also in prison with Paul, not as a prisoner, but as a guest, as well as at the death of Paul. So Luke traveled quite a bit, and he saw quite a bit of the ministry of Paul the apostle. Well, that's who wrote the book. Uh, let's come to a second matter, and that is to whom it was written to. Who was this book written to? Well, according to verse one of Acts chapter one, it was written to Theophilus. Theophilus. Now, Theo means God. Philus or phileo speaks of love, a brotherly love or a friendship kind of love. So the, uh, Theophilus, speaks of a friend or a lover of God, which leads some to believe that this is not a person at all, but simply someone who is a friend of God or a lover of God. Now, clearly the book of Acts is written to all believers, all friends of God, there's no doubt about that. However, back in Luke chapter one, verse three, Luke refers to Theophilus as the most excellent Theophilus, which is a Roman title, if you will. Somebody may be in the, a high-ranking military officer or somebody as a governmental official. Yet here in the book of Acts, that title, most excellent, is dropped. And now he's simply called Theophilus, which leads many to believe that this is an actual person, not simply the general friend of God, if you will. In fact, some believe that Luke, being a doctor, Colossians 4.14, was Theophilus's personal physician. Because in ancient times, one who was very wealthy or had high standing in the military or in the government would send one of their slaves, or one of their employees, we would call them, uh, to medical school, and they would become a doctor and they would become their personal physician. And it could be that Luke actually worked for the, the most excellent Theophilus, and through the message of the gospel, Theophilus actually came to faith in Jesus Christ. So Luke no longer addresses him by his former, former title, most excellent, but now simply Theophilus, as a brother in the Lord. Number three, the third thing is the what? What is the key theme of this book? What is this book all about? Well, if we had to pick one key theme, and we did, we would say that the key theme for the book of Acts 
deals with the acts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the apostles. Now clearly the title of the book is called The Acts of the Apostles, but the whole book is all about the acts of the Holy Spirit working in and through the life of the apostles. And if that is the key theme, we're gonna see a lot of aspects as it pertains to the working of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're gonna see the birth of the church as it pertains to the baptism with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit came down, alighted on those 120 in that upper room, and the church was birthed. It also involves the fulfilling of the Great Commission. Remember back in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here, we're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the disciples to fulfill that great commission to go out and spread the gospel. We're also going to see the, the power and the presence and the person of God's Holy Spirit as it pertains to the persecution, suffering, and death of the apostles. So everything we're going to be looking at in the book of Acts really involves the acts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the apostles. And if that is the key theme, and we believe it is, the key verse is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Take a look. Look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, a very familiar verse to all. Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the key theme is the acts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the apostles. The key verse is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you'll receive power from the Holy Spirit to fulfill that great commission. Well, let's come to a fourth matter, shall we? And that is the where. Where was this book written? Well, most believe it was written in Rome. In Rome. Uh, the book of Acts concludes in chapter 28 with Paul in Rome. Uh, we know that Paul and Luke were together in Rome in prison, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It leads most scholars to believe that the book of Luke, as well as the book of Acts, were written in Rome during Paul's first incarceration. That's the Praetorian guardhouse incarceration, not his second in the Mamertine prison, where he, of course, subsequently lost his life. Number five, the fifth thing is when. When was the book of Acts written? Well, we believe it was written around 60 to 62 AD for a couple of reasons for that early dating. Uh, number one, in the book of Acts, we do not have the mention of the great persecution against the Christians by the Emperor Nero in 64 AD. But the second reason is that there is no mention of the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 AD. So it leads many scholars to believe in an earlier writing around 60 to 62 AD. Now this brings us to the sixth thing, and that is the why. Why is this book so important? Well, the book of Acts is certainly an important book. There's no question about that for several different reasons, one of which involves the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers, as we've mentioned. Boy, this is like the key theme of the book, God's Holy Spirit working in the life of these apostles. Because in the gospel accounts, these apostles, well, they were less than stellar. Okay, they were knuckleheads to be sure. But in the book of Acts, boy, the transformation, the change. These guys go from a ragtag bunch of nothings to all of a sudden to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to turn the world upside down. It's an amazing, an amazing account 
That's why one reason it is so important. But I think the second reason it's so important is because it chronicles not only the birth of the church there in Acts chapter two, but the growth and maturing of the church as it pertains to the expansion of the body of Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ given through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it also shows us that the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, was not just for the Jews. It was also for the Gentiles. And when we get to Acts chapters 9 and 10, this will become a very significant picture that's painted for us as Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. And here we see for the first time Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But I think that a third reason why this book is so important is because it sets forth a model for you and I as the church today. You see, the early church, as we'll see in the book of Acts, was very simple. There was no hype and no hoopla, no bells and whistles, smoke and mirrors, gadgets and gizmos. There wasn't a lot of flashing lights and fancy frills. No, it was just simply a handful of guys telling people about Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit and seeing them come to faith in the Lord. And I'll tell you, this sets forth a great model, a great example for us as the body of Christ. Oh, sure, we've got a lot of things going on, a lot of events, a lot of activities, and a lot of different aspects as it pertains to the body of Christ or we as the church. But all of that flows from the simplicity of telling people about Jesus and getting them saved. Everything else flows very simply and very naturally from the main thing, and that is simply teaching Jesus, telling people about the good news of eternal life, that salvation is available to all, and the Holy Spirit is going to come upon all who are saved. So this book is very, very important. Well, let's come to the seventh and final thing we want to look at, and then we'll get into our text, and that is the how. Number seven and finally, how is this book divided? Well, we have divided the book of Acts into two very simple sections, and they deal with two people. The first division of the book of Acts deals with Peter's ministry. Peter's ministry, that's in chapters 1 through 12. The second section deals with Paul's ministry in chapters 13 through 28. So the division is very simple. Peter's ministry, chapters 1 through 12. Paul's ministry, chapters 13 through 28. And since the key verse is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. These two ministries are seen in light of that key verse, if you will, because Peter's ministry, chapters 1 through 12, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and was a witness to Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, all of Judea, and Samaria. Paul, on the other hand, filled with the Spirit, he too was a witness unto Jesus Christ to the end of the earth. So it's a, it fits together beautifully with the ministry of Peter, the ministry of Paul. Well, this brings us to Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and our study for today. So let's begin our reading in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll read down through verse Three in our time together today. Acts 1.1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, 
in these first three verses, we have the prologue of the book. Uh, that's this first section. It deals with the prologue of the book. And here, of course, get, Luke gives us an opening introductory statement, if you will, regarding our Lord. He deals with our Lord. And this prologue becomes very important because Luke talks about and deals with several different things as it pertains to our Lord, which really lays the groundwork, if you will, for the balance of the book. Now, if you're outlining or taking notes, uh, in this prologue, there are five things we want to look at in dealing with our Lord. Note them carefully. Number one, the first thing Luke deals with is the life of our Lord. The life of our Lord. That's seen in verse 1. It's pretty simple. Take a look. He said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, Theoph Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, this, of course, deals with the life of our Lord. In the Gospel of Luke, the former account that Luke made to Theophilus is about the life of our Lord. And here in verse 1, he deals with two aspects of the life of our Lord. First of all, he deals with the fact that Jesus was doing. Uh, look at the end of verse 1. It says, of all that Jesus both, uh, that began both to do. So the first part of our Lord's life involves doing. Now, Jesus did a lot of things. A lot of miracles, a lot of traveling, a lot of teaching. He did a lot of things, but none of those things are mentioned here. So here, it's not about what he did or was doing, but the fact that he was doing it. In our modern day vernacular, we might say Jesus was a doer. <laughs> he was a doer. He did a lot of things. And I think the reason this is so important for us is because we can say what we want. But the question is, are we doing it? Are we putting into practice that which we know? That's the example set by Christ, by the way. He was a doer. In fact, in John chapter 13, verse 17, Jesus said, if you know these things, good, but blessed are you if you do them. If we're putting them into practice, James 1.22 tells us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Because if we're only hearers of the word and we're not doers of the word, we're deceiving ourselves. Look, we can talk a good talk, but the question is, are we walking a good walk? We can say whatever we want, but the proof is in what we do. And Jesus Christ was a doer. And I hope and pray that that example that's set for each and every one of us really grabs hold of our lives. So we're not just constantly taking in, but like Jesus, we are continually giving out. So one aspect of the life of our Lord involves doing. Number two, uh, the second part involves teaching, according to the end of verse one, the twofold ministry of our Lord, doing and teaching. Now, Jesus, of course, is, was the amazing teacher because he is God after all. It's no wonder he was an amazing teacher. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, the Bible says that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. Question. What made Jesus' teaching so authoritative, so powerful, so much so that the people were astonished at his teaching? Well, what made his teaching so authoritative is that what he taught was the word of God. Look, every word that came out of his mouth was literally, literally the word of God. And again, that sets a, a glorious example for each and every one of us to the importance of teaching the Word of God. Not what we think, not what we feel, not what we believe people might want to hear. You can't believe how many pieces of mail I get on a weekly basis regarding church growth and 
oh, what do they call it? Um, surveys and uh, um, Pastor Tage got nothing. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, you know, surveys and um, marketing stuff. Marketing. It, okay, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what the terminology is. But finding out what people want to hear or what they like or what's going to affect them to get them to come to church, whatever that's called. You cannot believe the amount of information I get on that kind of stuff. I'm thinking, how sad, how tragic. All these marketing gimmicks, all these ploys. Look, we just need to teach the word of God. That's where the power is. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Doesn't matter what I think or what I feel. Doesn't matter even what we believe. The bottom line is what does the Bible say? I think it's important we simply teach the word of God simply because that's the power of God, Romans 1.16, to salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. But note carefully, class, in verse 1, dealing with the life of our Lord, it's not over. It's not completed. At the end of the verse, it says, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. This is just the beginning. <laughs> Even though Jesus is, is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, his life, if you will, of doing and teaching isn't over. This is just the beginning of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In other words, the ministry of our Lord, the life of our Lord in doing and teaching is ongoing today. How? Through the person of his Holy Spirit, teaching us all things. John chapter uh, 14, verse 26 and bringing to our remembrance that which he has given unto us. So the ministry, the life of our Lord of doing and teaching isn't over. He continues to work in each and every one of our hearts, growing us, maturing us, equipping us, and working his will in and through us. Well, let's come to a second thing in dealing with this prologue of the book as it pertains to our Lord. Uh, number one, we've looked at the life of our Lord, incredibly important. Number two, he deals with the ascension of our Lord. Equally important. Look at verse two. Talking about Jesus Christ, about his life on earth until the day in which he was taken up. This speaks of his ascension. Forty days after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. Uh, Luke wrote about that in Luke 24, 51. He wrote about it again in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Lord willing, we'll see that next time we're together. You said, Clark, you mentioned that these are important topics. Yes, they are. They're incredibly important. Well, what makes the ascension of Jesus Christ so important? Well, according to John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So clearly, the ascension of Jesus Christ becomes incredibly important. Because if Christ isn't ascended into heaven, the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit, would not have happened. And we would have been left to live life in our own power and in our own strength. But because Jesus was ascended into heaven, he fulfilled the promise of the Father by sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, who helps us, empowers us, and enables us not only to secure salvation, but to live a life that brings glory to the Lord. You see, apart from the Holy Spirit, we're working and operating in the flesh in our own power, in our own strength. But through the power and the person of God's Holy Spirit living and working and overflowing us, man, now all of a sudden we can go through life in light of God's Spirit. You know, I just don't understand how people get through life apart from Jesus Christ. 
truth of the matter is we go through a lot of difficulties in our lives. There's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of bumps and bruises. But when we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, working through us, man, now all of a sudden, whatever comes our way, we realize that it's okay. God's on the throne. And God's going to continue to pour out his Holy Spirit in my life to enable me, to empower me to get over this hump, to get through this valley, we might say. So the ascension of our Lord is incredibly important. Number three, the third thing involves the commands of our Lord. The commands of our Lord. Look at verse two again. In the middle of the verse, it says, after he, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, the power thereof, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So after his resurrection, Jesus gave a variety of commands to the apostles, many of which we know and have recorded. Uh, In Matthew 28, 10, Jesus commanded them to go to the Galilee after his resurrection. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus commanded them to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. In Acts 1, 4, Lord willing, we'll see Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. So there were a variety of commands that Jesus gave after the resurrection. You say, okay, Clark, I get that, but why is this so important? Well, because Prior to the book of Acts, Jesus gave the disciples a lot of commands as well. Prior to his resurrection, he commanded them on a variety of issues, many of which they failed to do. In fact, they failed miserably, let's face it. But now, now, in the book of Acts, we're going to see their ability to fulfill the commandments of Jesus Christ (laughs) absolutely amazingly. Why? because they're not trying to obey God's commandments in their own power and in their own strength. But now their obedience to the commandments of our Lord are gonna be by the Holy Spirit working in them. And listen class, this is an amazing thing. Precious, precious family. We need to really grab a hold of the importance of this concept. Because while it is true we have a choice to make. We have to choose within and in and of ourselves to desire or to want to obey Jesus' commandments. The fact of the matter is we can't do it in our own power and in our own strength. But when we make the right choice, when we choose in and of ourselves, say, Lord, I want to do what you tell me to do, then God says, right on. Now let me give you, okay, my translation, but... <laughs> Now let me give you the resources, the enablement so that you can obey me. And he sends his Holy Spirit to come upon us, to flow over us, to enable us to do what God's commanded us to do. And and you know, if we're trying to be obedient in the flesh, we might start off with a bang. We might do pretty good for a few days, maybe even for a few weeks. We might even hold out for a month or two. But then we're going to crash and burn because we're doing it in our own power and in our own strength. But when we're relying on God's Holy Spirit, now all of a sudden we have all the resources we need, the infinite, unlimited resources of God through the power of His Holy Spirit to enable us to do what God commands us to do. And that's why this is so important. Number four. The fourth major important issue that Luke deals with as it pertains to our Lord is the presentation of the Lord. The presentation of the Lord. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, we would say his death and resurrection, by many infallible proofs, a lot of tangible evidence being seen by them during 40 days. So after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was on earth for a 40 day period of time. He was revealing or presenting himself to a lot of people 
with many infallible proofs, a lot of tangible evidence to validate that Jesus was resurrected. In fact, in John chapter 20, verse 16, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other women at the tomb after the resurrection. In Matthew 28, 16, he, he appeared to the 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee. In Luke 24, 13, he appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus. In Luke 24, 34, he appeared to Peter in Jerusalem. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, he appeared to his half-brother James after the resurrection. In verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he appeared to over 500 people. And the presentation of our Lord during these 40 days after his resurrection becomes incredibly important because it validates the resurrection itself. It proves that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He was on earth for 40 days. He presented himself to many people with many infallible proofs, a lot of evidence. And the reason that becomes so incredibly important is because without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity. There's no church, there's no hope, there's no heaven, there's no healing. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is futile, we're still in our sins. That's how critical the resurrection of Jesus Christ really is. So this prologue that Luke puts forth becomes incredibly significant in laying the groundwork, if you will, for the balance of the book of Acts. Well, number five and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. The fifth and final thing in this prologue involves the words of our Lord. The words of our Lord. And look at the end of verse three. It says, and speaking of Jesus Christ, he was speaking of the things, these are his words, pertaining to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The words of our Lord involved the kingdom of God. Now the word kingdom means to rule or to reign. So the kingdom of God speaks of the rule and reign of God. And Jesus spoke quite a bit about the kingdom of God throughout his ministry of three and one half years on this earth. The kingdom of God was a very important and huge topic. And presumably, the disciples did not fully understand this precept, this principle of the kingdom of God. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they were wondering if Jesus was going to establish the kingdom there in Israel, right then, right there. They thought the rule and reign of God was going to happen immediately when the Messiah came onto the scene. And they were expecti expecting the Messiah to establish his rule and reign of God on earth, to overthrow the Roman occupation army, to liberate them from the bonds of slavery, if you will, under Rome, and to establish the perfect kingdom of God and reunite Israel under the rule and reign of God. Now, indeed, that will happen. There's no doubt about it. But when Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, his words, it wasn't about a future kingdom. Physically, it was about an immediate kingdom spiritually. Jesus Christ came the first time to establish the rule and reign of God in their hearts. In fact, Jesus himself said in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. He's talking about that internal kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in our hearts and in our lives. Yes, Jesus will come at his second coming to establish the kingdom of God, the millennial reign of God, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. That'll be at the end of the seven years of tribulation. But that is then. The words of our Lord, as it pertains to the kingdom of God, is speaking of the here and the now. And I think the point for you and I, practically, is very simple. Jesus Christ wants to rule and reign in our hearts and lives today. He wants to, to have absolute sway over every aspect of our lives. As we submitted our lives to him for eternal salvation, he desires for us to submit our lives to him 
for momentary guidance. Allowing God's kingdom to rule and reign in our heart. Allowing God to lead us, guide us, and direct us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Submitting to his will, to his wants, and to his ways. And you know, that was God's desire for them, and that's God's desire for us. Oh, that we too would be those who are willing simply to submit to the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to rule and reign in my heart. I want you to lead and guide my path. I want you to rule over each and every thought, every word I speak, every aspect of my life. Lord, that my life would bring glory to you. Amen. And Lord, we do thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that enables <laughs> that very thing to be accomplished in our lives. That your kingdom would be manifest thoroughly in our hearts that our lives would truly bring glory to you. And Lord, we realize apart from your Holy Spirit, that's simply impossible. But Lord, with you, in you, through you, because of you, Lord, we can do all things. We're more than conquerors. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the power of your word in our hearts, in our lives, the presence of your Holy Spirit leading, guiding, and directing and the principles that you've given us in your word to teach us, to touch us, to transform us. So Lord, we are just so thankful as we begin this book and ask for your Holy Spirit just to be poured out in each and every one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Shall we stand together? Next week, Lord willing, verse 4, read ahead. Okay, maybe verses 4 through 6, who knows? <laughs> if you need prayer today, after service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to minister to whatever need there may be in your hearts and lives today. And I do pray that God would continue to fill you with his Holy Spirit, encourage you, lead, guide, and direct you, using you in a very real and practical way as you go forth by his Spirit, by his grace. And that this would be a week that God would choose to do a great and mighty work in and through your lives. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.